This is our third and final faith in our righteousness series. And in this series, we've already covered what righteousness is. Uh, in a nutshell, it's just right standing with God, right and privileges, the condition of being accepted and, and pure in the sight of God. And on that first tape, I really made a point that there's two types of righteousness. There's the self-righteousness that we have to maintain in order to have a relationship with other people, to maintain integrity, to be promoted, etc. But when it comes to God, self-righteousness is totally inadequate and that we need God righteousness. And the scripture teaches that there is a righteousness which is of God. And that's what we get when we just believe in what Jesus did. And we believe that Jesus can substitute for us. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says that we become the righteousness of God in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1, I believe it's verse 30, says that Jesus has been made unto us. Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus is our righteousness. And it's wrong for a New Testament believer to say that all of my righteousness is like filthy rags. Take out of Isaiah chapter 64. I believe it's verse 6. That's true of a person when you are in self-righteousness before we get born again. But when we get born again, Jesus becomes our righteousness, and we are now made the righteousness of God. And we spent our first day basically showing the two types of righteousness, uh, proving that God's righteousness that comes by faith that is just a gift. It's not something that is based on our performance. It's the only way that we can ever relate to God. And on our second page, I begin to talk about how can this be possible? How is it that I could ever walk in true righteousness? How could a holy God look at me and accept me? And I show that God can never accept us as long as he's looking on the outside because we never get to where we are performing perfectly up to God's standard. And so what basically we shared on the second tape is how it's our spirit that gets born again and transformed and that in our spirit we are righteous and truly holy and that that condition does not change according to Hebrews chapter 10. Once we get born again, we are sanctified and perfected forever. That that's talking about our spirit. John, God, John 4, 24 says that God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God sees us in the Spirit, and that is how God can count us righteous, because it's not just Him overlooking the sin. In our Spirit, we totally are brand new. Our Spirit is as perfect, as pure, as clean as it will ever be throughout eternity. One third of our salvation is already complete, and that we are now in the process of taking that perfect salvation, the purity, the righteousness that is in our Spirit, and we are changing our thinking and that in return changes our actions. And so our soul and our body are in the process of change, but our spirit has already been changed. The change is perfect. The change is as complete, as, uh, as perfect as it will ever be throughout all eternity. And so that's what we dealt with on our second day. Now, this is the third and the final tape in this series. And what I want to do is bring up some things here. Then I think it's important for my point out. Because the teaching on righteousness and that God loves us independent of our performance, that God isn't dealing with us based on our actions, uh, if a person understands it properly, this should not lead to a lifestyle of sin, or it shouldn't lead to worship. A passive attitude towards sin. If a person really understands the tremendous price that was paid for this righteousness, that Jesus bore our sin, then love should make us live holy. We should now be motivated to serve God out of love instead of serving God out of fear that we're going to be punished, rejected, 
rejected. <laughs> prayers won't be answered, etc. And so if a person understands it properly, there is no conflict between the teaching on righteousness and a holy lifestyle. Matter of fact, you should live holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose once you begin to understand the love of God. But it's amazing how that people always bring this up and think that, man, this is going to encourage them. I want to deal with that. And I also want to specifically bring out some things that the Scripture says about condemnation and about feeling unworthy. And, you know, there is a, an apparent opposite truth to what I said. There's times that even a Christian to be convicted about the type of things that they're doing. And I think that maybe conviction is definitely the proper terminology instead of condemnation. But most people use those terms interchangeably. The point I want to make is that every truth in the Word of God has an apparent opposite truth that actually, instead of contradicting, it actually balances and makes it appropriate. Like, for instance, the Bible teaches that you're saved by faith without works in Romans chapter 3. But then James chapter 2 comes along and says how hey, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, those appear to be apparently opposite statements. Uh, so much so that Martin Luther, who received a great revelation of the grace of God, he couldn't harmonize those two. And Martin Luther actually tried to get the book of James taken out of the Bible because he just didn't believe it was inspired by Scripture. But I, and I'm not going to teach on that, but I actually believe that those two truths balance each other perfectly. You are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never wrong. Faith will have actions. And you can tell if a person has actions, I mean faith, by their actions. And that's what James is saying. You show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. They don't contradict each other. They actually balance each other. It's similar to a tightrope. You know, a tightrope has to be anchored at two opposite ends that are actually pulling against each other. It has to be pulled tight so that there's tension on the two. If you were to just hook a tightrope to one uh, side and not hook it to anything on the opposite side and then pull it tight, you, there's no way you can walk across it. It has to be stretched between two opposite points. It's also like if you're walking on a tightrope. You have this balance pole. And you know what? You, you have to hold that balance pole in the middle. If you get just one end of that balance pole, and then you had the other thing sticking way out there, that balance pole would actually knock you off there. It had to be held in the middle, and those two opposite ends out there actually provide balance and stability for the person walking on the rope. Well, it's true of every truth of God. Every truth of God has an apparent opposite. And that's the way that it is with righteousness. We are forgiven. We are in right standing. God views us as being righteous and holy. And yet there's a place for being under conviction. There's a place that Christians, if you act terrible, you ought to feel terrible. And I know that may sound contrary to somebody who's uh, just embraced what I've said about righteousness. But I want to bring this out because if I don't bring it out, I can guarantee you somebody else will bring it out. Or as you study the Word, you're going to see some of condemnation. You're going to see where God actually condemns people. Uh, your own conscience is going to condemn you. And if you just try and live without any sense of conviction or condemnation, if you believe that your actions have no consequence because you're righteous in the sight of God, that just will not play out. It will not work in reality. And so I want to provide an answer to this from Scripture with a view towards righteousness, all of the things that I've said. And hopefully, therefore, when this, this feeling of conviction, your own conscience condemns you, etc., when that comes up, you'll know how to react to it because you'll have to talk from the Word of God. Let me say this first of all. Let's get into this by saying this. That there are four sources of condemnation that I can think of. And, of course, this is just my own opinion. The Scripture doesn't say this in these terminologies. This is just to help us analyze it and understand it. You could break this down differently. 
uh, based on different people, personalities, perspectives, etc. But let me go through some of these real quickly, and then we'll come back and talk about them a little more in detail. First of all, God is a source of condemnation. And as I explained on the other tape, now we have received the righteousness that comes by faith. The Spirit is clean. God looks at us in the Spirit. And therefore, God's condemnation has been removed from the believer. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I'll be coming back to that verse. That verse says that God's condemnation is gone. Um, The Lord condemned us through the law is how God expressed his condemnation. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, calls the law a ministration of condemnation or a ministry of condemnation. God brought condemnation into the world through the Old Testament law. Romans 3.19 says that through the law, you know, it was given so that every man's mouth would be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. Now, I haven't got time to go into great detail on this, but I have a three-page series entitled The Nature of God, and especially the second tape on this going into great detail about how that the law wasn't given so that a person could be forgiven, but rather it was given to condemn us over the sin that we had so that we would turn from self-salvation, any deception that we could have that we could save ourselves, and we would throw ourselves on the mercy of God and ask for forgiveness by grace. That was the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was for condemnation. Now we are delivered from the law. Romans chapter 7 says that. It also says, says that in Romans chapter 6, that sin shall not have to be over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6, 14. And there are many, 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 many places, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, the book of Hebrews. There's just a lot of scriptures that talk about how that the New Testament believer is not under the law. So, even though God brought condemnation through the law, that is no longer a factor for the New Testament believer. Because we are not under the law, and so God is not condemning us. He sees us in spite of our sin. He deals with us based on who we are in the Spirit, and because of that, there is no condemnation from God towards the New Testament believer. The second source of condemnation is the devil. In the scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, where it's listing qualifications of an elder, and it says that they should not be a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, they fall into the condemnation of the devil. And it also says in Romans 8, 34, it's a question, and it says, Who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, and he is now ever living to make intercession for the saints. So it says that God is not the source of the condemnation for the Testament believer. Well, who is? Well, Satan. He goes about it. He's the accuser of the brethren out of Revelation chapter 12. And Satan can do it. And so, see, it's not just a matter of condemnation coming from God. Even though God has now removed his condemnation, judgment, the word condemnation literally means an adverse judgment or a condemning judgment. And it is now removed from the believer. God is not punishing us. God is not angry at us. God is not displeased with us because of our sin. But Satan will take advantage of our sin. And I'll come back to this in just a moment. And the third source of condemnation is what I'm calling God systems. And I know that that doesn't mean much to most people, but let me explain this. In other words, God placed systems in, in the earth whereby his judgment is dispensed. The purpose of this is for punishing the evildoers and rewarding those who do right. And some of the, basically, this is summarized in Romans chapter 13, and it says there that don't resist the power because there is no power but those that are ordained of God. It talks about government. It talks about re- rendering tribute unto Caesar and unto those who ask for it because it's rightfully theirs, etc. 
And so governments are ordained of God. And you know what? Even though God is not condemning a person for their actions, because it's not your self-righteousness that God relates to you on. He relates to you based on faith righteousness. God sees you righteous and holy and pure because your spirit's born again. So God's not released the condemnation. But if you go out and live in sin, Satan will condemn you. Satan will come against you. And the Bible says in John 10, 10, that the thief comes for no other purpose except to steal, kill, and destroy. So Satan is out to steal, kill, and destroy your life. And if you yield to him, he will do that. And that's condemnation. Sickness is condemnation. Poverty is condemnation. Depression, loneliness, anger, bitterness, and on and on. Any of those kind of things are Satan's forms of condemnation that he brings on the believer. He can't just do it to everybody. You have to yield to it. But then even outside of Satan directly condemning you, you can fall prey to the judgment, the condemnation of these, what I'm calling, God's governments. God will punish you. Satan will take advantage of your actions. But not only Satan, if you go out and if you rob somebody, there are God systems, such as governments, that will take advantage of that, and they will put you in jail, and they will bring prosecution against you, and you will suffer, and it will cost you a lot. And it's not God directly doing it, but it's the system that God ordained, and he ordained to repress evil and to allow righteousness to itself. And if you violate a, a code of conduct, if you live unholy, then you are opening yourself up to the judgment, the condemnation of what I'm calling these God systems. Not only government, but did you know church has a system of government in it? It's a God system. And say, for instance, you're in the church. And you say, hey, I'm the righteousness of God. I heard Andrew Woman preach on this, and so I'm righteous, and now, praise God, I don't have to live holy anymore because I'm righteous, and it doesn't matter what I do. Well, in the first place, you didn't hear those first two things. You didn't get the point that I did because the love of God would compel you to live holier than you ever lived under the law and legal. But just in case any person missed all of that, if, if God isn't judging you, if you truly are born again, God's judgment isn't coming on you, you still should live holy because Satan is going to bring conduct. Nation on you, and not only Satan, but the God systems. Government will come against you, and even if you don't break a written law of the land, if you're in a church and say, for instance, you become unfaithful and you aren't showing up for church anymore, say so you're a Sunday school teacher or you work in a nursery or you're a usher or you do some type of job, and if you become unfaithful, you don't show up, you don't do a good job, did you know that that church system, they will eventually can you, they will eventually quit using you because you are undependent and you could come back and say, but wait a minute, I'm righteous, and God loves me, and how dare you punish me in any way because I'm righteous. Well, you're righteous in your spirit, but your soul and your body are acting unrighteously, and you know what, you cannot reward that type of behavior. I hope you see that. So church has a system of government. In. Did you know the workplace has a system of government? You can't go to your boss and just say that, hey, I'm righteous. I've learned the truth. Andrew Wallach says I'm righteous. I'm clean and I'm pure forever. Sanctified and perfected forever. And so I don't know if I'll show up. It doesn't matter what I do. God loves me in spite of what I do. I'm sure he loves you in spite of what you do. But you aren't only a spirit. You also have a soul and a body. And I guarantee you, your employer didn't hire you by grace. And you are going to have to perform to be able to keep that job and to be able to get pay raises and promotions, etc. And if you do not perform in the natural, then there is a God system. I mean, just an intuitive knowledge that God is placed on the inside of everybody, and that is that you are going to be rewarded according to your actions. Now, God isn't going to deal with you that way, but you know what? Work will. Your employer will. And so you have to maintain good works for that. Another God system, what I'm calling, is in homes. Did you know that every home has a system of government? The husband is supposed to be the head of the house. 
the parents are supposed to be the head of the children. And if children were to listen to what I'm saying and say, hey, I'm righteous and I don't have to live holy anymore because God has forgiven me and I'm righteous and pure and how dare you ground me. You're grounding the righteousness of God. How could you do such a thing? Well, you've got to recognize that even though God may not punish you and he may not bring condemnation on you because you're now righteous in the spiritual realm, you have a soul and a body. And I guarantee you, you cannot promote ungodliness in any form or fashion. If children lie, if children steal, if children do, are not trustworthy, if they aren't keeping their words, if you find out that they've done something, it is the job of a parent to uh, bring some form of discipline on that. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about child training and discipline, but, you know, that's a separate issue. But the point here is that it's not wrong for a parent to correct their child. Even if that child is born again and in their spirit, they're the righteousness of God. You aren't only a spirit, you're also a soul and a body, and that soul and body has to learn how to perform in this earth. And you're going to have conflict in relationships until you begin to start acting right. And it is correct. It's scriptural for a parent to correct their child. Now, see, if a person doesn't understand these kind of things, they can take teaching on righteousness and go to an extreme out here where, in a sense, they're saying, well, man, this is promoting an ungodly lifestyle. I can do anything. God loves me. It doesn't matter what I do. And that's not what God says. That's not what I've said. That's, I just don't understand how people can get it this point. But I'm belaboring it, trying to uh, make sure that nobody misunderstands this. You know, I've had employees of mine, some of my best friends, that I've actually had to fire. And I remember them coming back to me and saying, but how could you do this? I thought you loved me. Etc. And I say, hey, I do love you. And you know what? I, I honestly did not change in my attitude towards them. I love them. I would like to maintain a relationship with them. It wasn't a personal thing that I was against them. But they were doing something here in this ministry that was, that was hurting me. It was hurting the ministry. It was affecting the other employees, etc. And uh, I won't promote an attitude like that. And if it gets bad enough, I'll actually fire a person. And they say, but I thought you believed in grace. Well, I do believe in grace. I still will love them. I'll give them a recommendation for another job if it, you know, it's something that I can honestly recommend them for. If it's not one of those things that cause me to fire them, etc. But I have to deal with them based on their flesh. Uh, the physical job here is a physical thing. It's not based on who you are in Christ. It's based on your physical performance. We live in a world where you cannot just say, hey, I'm righteous in the sight of God and forget it. You have a soul and a body that must maintain a self-righteousness to be able to get along with other people. And if you don't, then there are systems of government, what I'm calling these God systems, the civil government, church government, uh, work type of government, uh, government in a home. And I'm sure you could add other things to that. All of those things are going to come against you, and you're going to suffer if you don't live a outwardly physical, righteous life. And in the last area, the source of condemnation is your own personal conscience. In Romans chapter 3, verse 15, the scripture there talks about even a Gentile has their thoughts either accuse them or excuse them. Without me going into a great teaching on the subject of conscience, I've got this on the page of the title, A Good Conscience. And uh, it'll go into all these kind of things. But your conscience is a part of you that either accuses you or excuses you. Over in 1 John chapter 3, the scripture there says that if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. And that right there shows that God is not the one that condemns us, but our heart can condemn us. But what part of our heart? It's a conscience. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, it says that if you don't have a good conscience, it'll make your faith shipwreck. Now, this is talking to believers. And so, see, your conscience, if you go out and live an unholy lifestyle, if you were to take what I'm saying and say that, praise God, I'm righteous, and so it doesn't matter if I live right anymore. You go out and start living in sin, your own conscience is going to condemn you. And because of that, your faith will become shipwrecked. You won't have any confidence, any boldness. 
intercessor. So your conscience is something that you have to deal with. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 says that the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse our conscience from dead work so that we can serve the living God. If you don't get your conscience purged by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never be effective in serving God. And there's two ways to deal with a defiled conscience. Number one, you're going to have to apply the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to it because you'll never be perfect. But you know another way to deal with a defiled conscience is quit defiling it. <laughs> I mean, uh, if, if it seems like that you are just self-condemned, your conscience is condemning you constantly, there's, there's two ways to deal with that. As much as you can, quit defiling your conscience. And you won't have to sit there and just purge it and purge it and constantly go back and deal with this thing. But nobody's going to live perfectly, and so everybody, regardless of how how well you live, you are going to have to be strong in the grace that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have to take the blood of the Lord Jesus and purge your conscience. And you can do that. He reaches the verse 2 says that you could actually come to a place where there is no more conscience of sin. Man, that's awesome. Again, you need to get that tape and buy it. Really, conscience. That would really go into a lot of detail. Also, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 says that we have to come before the Lord with a pure heart, with, with our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. We have to get set free from this evil conscience. So let me go back. God is one source of condemnation. The devil is a source of condemnation. What I'm calling God's system, such as government, church, work, home, those are uh, a source of condemnation, judgment against you if you do something wrong, and then your own conscience. Now, out of these four areas that I've described, God's condemnation against us has been removed. And that is what I've been preaching on the first two days, that God is not the source of our condemnation. God is not judging us, dealing with us based on performance. But when we make Jesus Christ the Lord of our life, we become a new creature. In the Spirit, God is a Spirit. He relates to us on the basis of that Spirit. And we can come boldly before God even when we belong, even when we sin. And we still have that righteous nature that is not based on performance. And that's how we relate to God. So from God's standpoint, condemnation is no longer an issue. God is not the one that condemns us. But does that mean that there is no condemnation? Let me turn back over to these scriptures in Romans chapter 8 and share this with you. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This says that there is no condemnation. The word no here is an absolute negative. And what that means is it's saying that there is absolutely none. Zilch, not. In other words, this isn't saying that there is a limited condemnation. There is no, absolutely no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's describing right a person who's born again, whose spirit has been changed. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, this phrase here, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, some uh, translations won't even put that in the first uh, verse of the eighth chapter, but it is in the fourth verse. It comes back again and says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. But the point that's being made is that when you are in Christ Jesus, and that's talking about the born-again Spirit part of you, there is no condemnation, no adverse sentence, no judgment against any person who is in Christ Jesus. But that's when you walk after the flesh and not after the Spirit. Did you know when you are after the flesh, when you are walking after the flesh, which is talking about sin, unrighteousness, then there is condemnation. Now, there still is no condemnation from God. And I want to stress this point because uh, many people who preach a lot of legalism and law and teach that God does deal with you, 
based on your performance. They know this scripture, and what they'll say is, well, yes, there's no condemnation when you are in Christ Jesus. In other words, when you are living holy, when you're doing everything right, then there's no condemnation, no judgment against you. But when you get out of line, then the wrath of God comes on you. God won't answer your prayers. God won't do this. God won't do that. And if you believe that, then in a sense, you have just totally voided all of the teachings of righteousness, all of the things that we've already dealt with. We've already shown you how that you, your spirit becomes righteous, and it's not a condition that fluctuates. It's in your spirit. It is eternal. You are sanctified and perfected forever. We've already dealt with that. And if you believe that God is condemning you when you get into the flesh, then... Just basically, it just voids all of this teaching on righteousness because all of us get into the flesh. All of us at times do things that are contrary to what we should. And if we believe that God is going to separate from us and that we have to, you know, be born again again and get back into the Anyway, there's so many things that I could deal with here. Uh, if you believe that, it's just going to totally void all of this. This is this is talking about from God's standpoint. There is no condemnation, no judgment, no adverse sentence against you ever. But there is condemnation, not from God, but there is condemnation from one of these other sources. If you aren't walking after the Spirit, but instead you begin to start walking after the flesh. See, the reason I'm saying this is to try to make a point that I've been talking about how God deals with us and how God views us. That's the primary concern. That's the number one thing. Only dealing with God. See, we have an adversary, the devil out there seeking whom he may devour, and he will condemn us. We have these systems that God placed in the earth, such as government, work, home, all of these things, and those things will come against you. You will have individuals come against you if you mistreat them, etc. And you will be condemned. You will be judged. You could go to prison. You could lose your job. You could be grounded. Man, you could lose your position in the church if you don't maintain godliness. There is condemnation out there if you are not living a godly life. With your own conscience will continue. So the point I'm making is that, yeah, it's still important to live holy. It's important to maintain righteousness. Let me just back up a little bit into Romans chapter 6, and we're going to work our way back up to these points in Romans chapter 8 and look at some things. But in the book of Romans, I've used a lot of this teaching as I've gone through teaching on the subject of righteousness. And basically, the book of Romans in the first five chapters has made such a case that we become righteous, not through our own works, but through putting faith in Jesus, and that it's just something that is given to us, especially the last part of the fifth chapter. I dealt with those on the last page you know, extensively. I talked about that five different times. It says in the same way that we became sinners through one man's disobedience, we become righteous through one man's obedience, and that's Jesus. And it says that as sin has abounded, uh, even much more so grace abounds. Etc. So that's all up to the fifth chapter. Now, this made such a case for righteousness by faith instead of a self righteousness by works that it raises this question in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Of course, the answer is, is God forbid. And so, right here in the sixth chapter, Paul gives two reasons why, if you understand grace, you don't go live in sin. The first one, in Romans chapter 6, verses 2 on through verse 13, is basically saying that you have a new nature. And that now that you are born again, you don't have this drive to sin anymore, but instead you've got a drive to be holy. Now, that might need some explanation because some people think, well, man, I know I'm born again. I experienced a change in my life, but I still have this drive to sin. Well, you don't have a nature, a sin nature that causes you to sin. What you have is an old man, is what the scripture calls it, and that's talking about your unrenewed mind and your power. It's your flesh that desires to satisfy itself. You have hormones, desires, etc., and things like this. And it will draw you towards sin. Satan will play on those kind of things. 
specifically that unrenewed mind. And he will use that to draw you towards sin. And you may think that it's a nature, but it's really not. It's just what the old nature, that sin nature, taught you how to be. It taught you how to be selfish. It taught you how to lust. It taught you how to do these kind of things. And your mind has been programmed that way, and you will continue to lust and act those ways until you renew your mind. In other words, you don't have to stay in that terrible state. Well, let me just say a couple of things here. I don't want to go into great detail because I could spend an hour or two on this one point. But, uh, see, this is where a lot of self-help groups miss it. A lot of self-help groups are basically teaching people how to control their behavior, behavior modification. And through group sessions where you're accountable to a group or something, and if you go out and live in sin, then there's going to be some retribution, some rejection from people, or you're going to have to stand up and embarrass yourself and confess it. Those kind of things can provide you with motivation that can help you stop doing those things. They can also provide you with substitutes. You know, there's some people that for drugs, they put them on, uh, I forget the name of it now, but anyway, it gives you a lot of the same sense of drugs, but it's not a habit for me. And so it kind of deals with the cravings, with the physical flesh part of it, and yet basically is weaning you away from the addiction itself. Uh, there's, there's people that just switch it. I knew a woman one time who was an alcoholic, and she went to the Raleigh Creek and she boasted of being delivered, of being an, al- uh, an alcoholic. But she had to have a glass with ice in it of testing for a diet cup of diet Dr. Pepper. I mean, at all times. I was with this woman for two or three days. We were on a television program, and she was testifying about her deliverance. She was an ex-movie star. And she was giving testimony about how she was delivered, but the truth is she wasn't delivered at all. She just had changed her addiction from alcohol to diet Dr. Pepper. And, of course, some people might say, well, that's great. Well, it's better than being an alcoholic. But I tell you what, she was still bound. I mean, I saw that woman literally get to shape. She had people running everywhere to find her a diet caffeine-free Dr. Pepper. She couldn't be with that. She still had an alcoholic mentality. Did you know if you go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and please don't misunderstand me, I'm not against them. I've had friends, I've had employees that have actually been helped by them. They do a service. I'm not totally against it, but there are some mistakes. And one of those mistakes is that when they stand up in a meeting, they'll say, Hello, my name is, and they will give their name. And then they'll say something like, I've been an alcoholic for 15 years, and I've been sober for five years. What they're saying is that they are still an alcoholic, and they're only one drink away from becoming an alcoholic again. In other words, there isn't a heart change. They still are an alcoholic. They still have the attitude of an alcoholic. They still have the condemnation, a lot of the feelings and emotions of an alcoholic. They just aren't participating in it at the moment. Well, that is not the way that Jesus does that. Jesus changes your nature. And a person who was an alcoholic before they got born again, Jesus comes in and gives you a brand new heart that that heart has no vices like that. It is righteous. It is pure. It is holy. Now, that doesn't mean that you're automatically set free from alcohol. Some people experience that, but even sometimes... Well, the principles and rules and regulations. The Christian life isn't just hard to live, it's impossible to live. Did you know that turning the other cheek to a person when they smite you on one cheek, turning the other cheek like Jesus said, that's not just difficult, that's impossible. There's no way that you could take somebody, somebody could take you to the law, and if they sue you and take away your coat, give them your cloak also, offer them something else. If they compel you to take their, their burden for one mile, carry it two miles and just go on love. Then when they revile you and say things against you, just love them. When they crucify you, kneel down and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know what? Those things aren't humanly possible. It takes the supernatural ability of God to accomplish that. 
And that's what Paul is saying. Romans chapter 7, these verses are describing the complete inability of our flesh to ever match up with the things of God. And it leads right into the 8th chapter. It begins to talk about the joy and the delight and the freedom of a spirit-filled life. Look at the last verse, or the next to last verse of Romans chapter 7. It says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You know, that's not describing the all the way he was living. That's Paul describing the way it would be for him if he wasn't letting the Spirit control and live through him. If he was just trying to, you know, white knuckle it through and grit his teeth and resist and deny sin, that's the way it would be. It would be so that he'd try, but he just couldn't do it. It would be a terrible existence, oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver you from the body of his sin. In verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. The flesh can never please God. Matter of fact, it says this over in Romans chapter 8. In verse 8, it says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That was the point he was making in Romans chapter 7. And so he talks about praise God, there's deliverance through Jesus. So how does it come? Now we're back to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. When you are in Christ Jesus, and the only part of you that is in Christ Jesus, 100% of the time is your spirit. Your spirit, that born-again part of you, as I discussed on the last day, it never fluctuates, it never varies, it is always righteous and pure, it can sanctify and protect its breath. So the spirit part of you never receives condemnation or judgment from God, so it can protect it forever. And as long as we are letting the Spirit dominate our mind, our will, our emotions, and our actions, there will be no condemnation, no judgment against us in the soul or in the body. But it says there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. If we get out of walking after the Spirit, and we start walking after the flesh, then God still isn't going to be the one that condemns you. But there is a condemnation from the devil. There is a condemnation that comes from the God system, the government that is placed in home, work, civil government, etc. And your own conscience will condemn you. And so there is condemnation, but it's just, there's no condemnation when you are in Christ Jesus. In verse 2 it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Praise God. Boy, that is an awesome thing. See, in the Old Testament, there was a judgment that every time you sin, you reap death. You reap some form of punishment. But the law of the Spirit... When you're born again, Christian, you still have to deal with some of those actions, but what you're dealing with is a mind that has just been conditioned to that lifestyle. You're dealing with maybe physical things in the body where you become dependent upon that stimuli. And you have to break those things. But in your nature, there is no longer this craze for it. There is no longer this dependency and a trust that you have to have. Jesus provides more than any of that stuff. And so Jesus changes your heart. And then the physical actions, it's just a matter of time. To, if, you, if you allow that spirit, the born-again spirit, I'm not to to dominate. it's just a matter of time until the physical realm begins to reflect the change that's taking place in the heart. So the point I'm making is, and this is what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 6, why don't you live in sin? You know, if this be true, if we're righteous in the sight of God by faith and not by our actions, well then why not just go live in sin? But God forbid, that is not what he's saying. Number one, if you are truly born again, you don't desire to sin. 
you may be sinning, but it's not because you desire to sin. A truly born again person wants to be pure. I think I used that verse already, First John chapter 3, verse 3, that every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. If you are truly born again, you desire to live for God. You might be doing a poor job of it because you don't know the truth. You're under religion, all kinds of deception, etc. But a true born again person has a drive to live holy. And that's what Paul is discussing here in Romans chapter 6. And then the second reason in Romans chapter 6 that you don't go out and live an unrighteous lifestyle is that he says in verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself, servants to obey his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin and of death, or of obedience unto righteousness. So even though God has now forgiven me, why don't I go live in sin? Number one, I don't want to. I've got a new nation. Man, I want to live holy. Number two, I recognize that even though God won't impute sin unto me, God won't condemn me because of my sin, Satan will. Satan will take advantage of it. If I yield to sin, then I yield to Satan, the author of that sin. And again, I use that verse in John 10, 10. It says that the thief comes for no other purpose except to steal, kill, and destroy. And I don't want Satan to come in and steal, kill, and destroy in my life. And so I live holy, number one, because I desire to live holy, but number two... And I live holy because I don't want to give Satan an inroad into my life. Well, that is powerful. That is so simple. So, see, there are other sources of condemnation to God. There is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. God isn't condemning them. But there is condemnation that comes from the devil. It comes from the system that God put in place, government, etc. And there is your own conscience that condemns you. So there is condemnation out there. And as much as you possibly can, you need to live as holy as you possibly can. And then when you do fall short, you need to be strong in the grace that's in the Lord Jesus and learn how to take the blood of the Lord Jesus and purge your conscience from dead work. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. But boy, this is powerful stuff. Then Romans chapter 7 uh, begins to talk about how that we have become dead to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're no longer under. And then in Romans chapter 7, and let's start reading with verse 14. It says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. And on and on it goes. You know, it's amazing. There are a lot of people that have taken these passages of Scripture. And they said that this is the description of the normal Christian life. That even the Apostle Paul wrote that he couldn't do what he wanted to, that he found himself constantly doing what was wrong, and he just was living a sinful life, etc. Now, that is not what Paul said. If you take all of this in context, he's been talking about the grace of God, that we become righteous for just by putting faith in the goodness and the grace and mercy of God. And so then in the sixth chapter, he says, why do we live holy then? Two reasons. Number one, you've got a new nature. Number two, you don't want to give place to the devil. In Romans chapter 7, what he's doing is describing our inability in ourselves to ever fulfill the standards that God has set forth for us. Now, that, that's what he's saying. For instance, here in Romans chapter 7, verse um, 18, he says, For I know that in me, and then in parentheses, he says, That is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Did you know if that parentheses hadn't have been there, that would have been an understanding. If Paul would have just said, I know that in me is no good thing. There's a lot of people that can relate to that and think that that's the way that it is. But that is not true. He's saying, that is, in my flesh. In the flesh here is describing more than what we call flesh, more than just the skin on your body. But the term flesh is referring to all of the physical part of you and the soulish part of you, the mind, will, and emotions. 
And uh, any part of you that is not controlled by the spirit is called flesh. And so flesh here is referring to, you could use the terminology, the old man, the part of you that is not yet renewed by the power of God. And so he's just talking about you on your own. It doesn't matter if you are living a sinful life or if you're a very good person. It doesn't matter. If you are on your own, the part of you that is not being controlled by God, the non-spirit born-again part of you is incapable of serving God. And that's what he's describing. He's describing the absolute frustration, the absolute inability of any person to please God out of their own ability. Another thing that will help prove that point is that in the book of Romans, chapter 7, the word spirit is only used one time in Romans, chapter 7. And in that instance, it's not talking about the Holy Spirit, but it's talking about a mental disposition. In other words, like we say, school spirit. You aren't talking about some spiritual being. You're talking about an attitude. They had a great school spirit. Man, they've got a, an attitude. So that's the way that the word spirit is used. In Romans chapter 7, one time. In contrast, in Romans chapter 8, the word Spirit is used 22 times. And it's talking about the Holy Spirit. And Romans chapter 8 is one of the most victorious, uh, positive chapters in the entire uh, Bible. Just talking about victory, victory, victory. And see, it's a contrast. Romans 7 is talking about, uh, he's already proven that you are made righteous in the sight of God, not by you. Your works, but by God, He did it for you, and all you do is accept it by faith. In Romans chapter seven, He's trying to emphasize this uh, by showing that you couldn't please God. Your flesh can't ever adhere to all spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from that law of sin and death, sin and judgment, sin and rejection. If I sin, I don't get my prayers answered. If I sin, God's angry at me. If I sin, then this is going to happen. I'm free from it. Christ set me free from that. I'm free from the law of sin and death. Now, does that mean that there is no consequence to sin? No sin. Well, as no faith will condemn you over it. These God systems in place in the earth will condemn you, and your own conscience will condemn you. And so you still need to live holy, but God will condemn you. Verse 3, for what the law could not do in the weak through the flesh, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He's talking about he condemned sin in the flesh of his son, the Lord Jesus. God placed your condemnation, your judgment upon Jesus. And so God will never judge you. If he would, that would be like double jeopardy. He's already punished Jesus. He put his condemnation in the flesh of the Lord Jesus. He's already forsaken him. Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reason God forsook him is because he took our sins upon him and he bore our condemnation. And so God has already put his wrath on Jesus. He will never place his wrath upon you. God is not going to condemn you. Does that mean that there is no condemnation? Well, there's no condemnation to God, but there is condemnation from other sources. If you'll remember what I said at the beginning when I was talking about the different sources of condemnation, God expressed his condemnation through the Old Testament law. And I gave you some examples, Second Corinthians chapter 3 and Romans chapter 3. Here's another one in John chapter 3. It's a real familiar passage of Scripture, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish and have everlasting life. Verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You can say it this way. God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to bear the condemnation that the world deserved. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now that's talking about that there is condemnation for those who don't believe on Jesus. And if you follow this on down to the very last verse of the third chapter of John, in verse 36, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. What is the wrath of God? Well, in Romans chapter 4, in verse 16, it says, Because the law works wrath. 
For where no law is, there is no transgression. When it says that the wrath of God abides on an unbeliever, what that's talking about is that unbeliever is still under the law. And the law is what ministers God's condemnation, God's rejection, God's adverse sentence, judgment against us. And so the law is how God released His judgment, His punishment into the earth. If you're born again, you're exempted from the law. You are out from under the law. But if you aren't born again, then the law is still in effect. There is still judgment from God. And you need to accept that that judgment was placed on Jesus. And you need to let Him pay that sin instead of you paying it. Once you get born again, that law is taken out of the way. But you know what? The Old Testament law is still here. Even though God isn't enforcing it for His children, it's still here. And one of the ways that Satan brings his condemnation with us when we sin is it through... Zakon w dalszym ciągu ma moc. W dalszym ciągu jest głosem Boże. A żeby być uwolniony z tym zakonu, no, musisz przez wiarę pozwolić Jezusowi wziąć Twoje potępienie i zapłacić za grzechy zamiast Ciebie. Kiedy narodzisz się na nowo, prawo przestaje obowiązywać Ciebie. Starotestamentowe prawo istnieje w dalszym ciągu. Bóg nie egzekwuje go w stosunku do swoich dzieci, ale ono w dalszym ciągu istnieje. Jedynym z, jeden ze sposobów, jaki szatan przynosi swoje potępienie przeciwko tym, którzy grzeszą, jest poprzez religię. Religion. Most religion is still preaching the law. They're still preaching that you have to perform. They're teaching that you have to do certain things to be accepted with God. And they aren't teaching just faith in the Lord Jesus, but rather they're telling you that unless you to pray, study the Word, pay your tithes, do this, do this, do this, that God won't accept you. Now, that's what the Old Testament law says, and there was a period of time that God gave that standard to show you that you could never be righteous on your own, so that you would come and trust in the Savior. But once you trust in the Savior, and once you become the righteousness of God through putting faith in Jesus, God is not wanting you to live holy based on the law, but rather He's wanting love, uh, an appreciation for the great salvation that God has given you to be a motivation to make Live holy. But sad to say, most religions, most Christian religions, are still using the law of fear of punishment and judgment to motivate people. And so the law is the source of wrath. It's the law of the source of condemnation. And so Satan will use religion to condemn people. And that is one of the major sources. That's the reason that I've done this entire series on the subject of righteousness. It shows you that you become righteous by faith, not by performance. And it's something that takes place in the spirit and it's constant. It's something that doesn't fluctuate or change. And on this tape, I'm trying to make clear that even though you're righteous in the sight of God, that that righteousness is uh, in the spirit realm, in the physical realm, there still needs to be maintained a self or a life of somebody's own performance, not so that God will accept you. That's already done. But you give place to the devil if you aren't living a right. Satan will condemn you. If God system will condemn you. And your own conscience will condemn you. You cannot afford it. You know, I do not take the teaching, the things that I shared on these tapes about me being the right to of God. And I don't live a sinful life because of it. As a matter of fact, my standard of holiness is greater than most people that I deal with. And I normally wouldn't even make this comparison, except I'm, I'm just trying to prove a point here that I do not take the grace of God and use it as an excuse to go live in sin. That's not what happens in my life. The revelation that God has given me doesn't make me want to live in sin. Number one, I have a new nation and I want to live for God. But also, I'm aware that Satan is out there and he's still condemned. And I don't want the condemnation of the devil. 
I don't want him to come steal, kill, and destroy. I don't want to be a place for the devil so that he can come in and just take away my finances and take away my health, take away my family. I don't want those kind of things. So I still live a very holy life, not so that God will accept me. But so that Satan won't have any right. I also live a holy life because of my relationship with people, with these God systems, government, church, work, home. Did you know what? I have a clear conscience. If a policeman pulls me over, you know what? I'm not afraid that I'm going to be found out that I've got an outstanding warrant somewhere that he's going to get me for something. The Bible says that, uh, that the uh, law officers are ministers of God for good to us, that they are not a terror to those who have good works, but for those who do not have good works, they had better be afraid so they don't bear the sword in vain. That's out of Romans chapter 13. Basically what that's saying is that, I, you know, you can have a clear conscience. You can get to a place where I'm not afraid to see a policeman. But talk to him because I haven't done anything wrong. And man, that's safety. That's security. You know, when it comes to church, man, I live a life of integrity, and I can guarantee you I, I travel, and so I'm not, you know, really involved in my local church the way that some people are because I spend my time on the road. I just can't do it. But when it's before, I got to travel, and when I was involved in church, I guarantee you people could count on me because I wanted them to count on me. I wanted to serve. I wanted to do that kind of thing. And so I have a clear conscience in those areas. Again, I'm my own employer, and so it doesn't really uh, pertain to me, you know, about an employee-employer relationship. But I have worked for other people, and when I worked for them, man, I was faithful. I maintain righteousness in that area, and because of it, I've always been promoted. I have never been demoted. I've never been criticized. I mean, I've had a good work ethic. I've actually uh, been offered partnerships in businesses when I was only there for a couple of months because I turned the entire business around. You know what that is? That's maintaining a righteousness in the physical realm. If you don't do that, you're going to be the person who gets passed over, and then you get bitter at God and say, why did God bless me? Well, maybe it's because you're such a sorry worker that God can't promote you. There's no way that that boss is going to want to promote that sorry attitude. See, you need to maintain righteousness in the physical realm. And then in your own conscience, boy, this is an area that Satan really plays on. Satan comes against that. There is an intuitive knowledge on the inside of every single person. And even when you get born again, your conscience doesn't cease to work. Your conscience is something that you cannot be delivered on. You can't cease to have a conscience. Matter of fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Scripture talks about that it's a sign of the end time, and it's a doctrine of devils when a person gets their conscience seared with a hot iron. That means that it's just basically killed all of the nerves, that there's no longer any fear. When a person gets to a place that they no longer have a conscience, then something is seriously wrong. That is not the way God made us to be. You have a conscience. And your conscience isn't a 100% reliable guide. That's the reason the Bible talks about you know, having your conscience purged. I mean, your heart purged from an evil conscience. In Hebrews 9.14 and Hebrews 10.23. Your conscience isn't 100% reliable, but on the other hand, you can't just deny it. You can't just reject it. You know what? Every person, even a Christian, has this intuitive knowledge of right and wrong on the inside. And that can be perverted. My conscience was, uh, through religion, made to be so sensitive that I got to see them defiled every time I went into a restroom and saw profanity, scribbled on the stalls and things like that. I got condemned. And I wasn't the one that did it. You can have too active of a conscience. I used to feel like that I was defiled uh, if I ever went swimming in a public swimming pool. So the church I was raised in, they called it mixed bathing. If you went swimming with people of the opposite sex, and they said that that was sin and that that was wrong, and they used the term mixed bathing to make it sound worse. That sounds worse than swimming, baby. You know, just sounds worse. And so, I mean, I used to feel condemned and defiled if I did that. I never had danced in my life because dancing was a cardinal sin. 
And you know what? I've come to realize that those things, there's, there may be some degree of wisdom in that. I mean, certainly you can go to a public swimming place and see a lot more than what you need to see. But technically speaking, you know, my conscience would be filed in an area that necessarily uh, that wasn't what the way God made it. You know, in the book of Corinthians, you can see in First Corinthians that Paul made that comparison about eating meat that was offered unto idols. And he said, technically, there's nothing wrong with that because an idol isn't a true thing. There really isn't a false god who is just demons and stuff. And so technically speaking, you could offer meat offered unto idols. But he said, because of people's conscience, if they see you do that and they have uh, a knowledge of this idol, and if they really believe that this idol is a demon god, etc., and all that then you can defile their conscience. And even though there's nothing actually wrong with what you've done, their conscience, if they violate their conscience, they will damn themselves. Romans 14, 23 talks about that. To him that knows that he's good, does it not to him that he's seen. And so he's saying that you, you can't just violate your conscience. So your conscience, whether it's a right or wrong standard, if you violate it, then it can condemn you. And so we need to go to the Word of God and make sure that all of our convictions are truly based on accurate understanding of the Word. But then even beyond that, when you do something that is, I mean, really wrong, your conscience will smite you. And you know what? You can use that as a positive thing. Now, you can't. You can't stay there. You can't stay in the point where you are feeling guilty and condemned. You know what? Let me say some things. I hope this is understood properly. But I see Christians doing things. But you know what? They should feel uh, some condemnation. Not condemnation from God. Not rejection from God. But they ought to feel terrible the way they I see Christians that lie. I see Christians that steal. I see Christians that do things that sometimes, you know, Paul even said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, you've done things that aren't even named among the Gentiles. You're doing things that even lost people would do. And then he got upset with them. But you know that there's times that you ought to feel rotten. There's times that some of you act like the devil and do things and lose your temper and stuff. And you know what? You ought to feel rotten. Now, you shouldn't feel that you've lost your salvation. You shouldn't feel that God has rejected you. You should still feel that I can come boldly to the throne of grace and get, get the... Uh, uh, back into fellowship and relationship with God the way that I should be. You should, you should uh, be able to be strong in the grace that's in the Lord. But you know what? There's just kind of certain things that you ought to feel rotten about. If you aren't doing a good job for your employer, you ought to feel rotten about that. And you will feel rotten. Your conscience will condemn you. And so, again, I say there's two ways to deal with this. Number one, quit doing things that defile your conscience. But then, number two, you'll never be perfect in that area, and you just have to be strong in the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, trust in that forgiveness. Okay, these are some powerful, powerful, powerful truths. In Luke chapter 7, there was an instance where Jesus went to eat at a Pharisee's home, and while he was there, a woman who was a sinner came to Jesus, and she had this alabaster box of ointment, and she stood behind him, and she began to uh, wash his feet with her tears, and then wipe her, his feet off with the hairs of her head, and then she kissed his feet, and then anointed him with this ointment. And when the Pharisee saw it, he got indignant and thought in himself. He didn't say this out loud, but he thought, if this man were really a prophet, he would know that this woman was a sinner. And here's what I want you to see in Jesus' reaction in, in John, or, excuse me, Luke chapter 7, verse 40. Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debts. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou right rightly judge. And then he made the application. In other words, he wasn't really talking about these creditors. He was using this to illustrate something that he wanted Simon to do. 
And he answered and said unto him, he says, You see this woman, I entered into your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. Her head with oil you did not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins are many are forgiven for he loves much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves much. And so the point that he was making was this woman was a terrible sinner, and yet she experienced the forgiveness of God, and it made her so thankful that she loved him enough to, to wipe her feet, wipe Jesus' feet with tears, I mean, wash his feet with tears, wipe them with the hairs of her head, and anoint his feet. Simon didn't consider himself a great sinner, and so therefore he didn't really appreciate the forgiveness that Jesus was offering. Now, what this basically is saying is that people who are big sinners, great sinners, love much when they are forgiven. People who are forgiven very little love little. And you know what? I have always looked at this verse, and in a sense, it has blessed me. Because according to people's standards, according to man's judgment, I haven't done most of the things that most people have done. And this verse would make it look like that I couldn't love God as much as somebody who did these terrible things. And you know what? That doesn't bless me because I want to love God as much as anybody. And you know what? My perception is, as I minister to people, that my love for God and my appreciation for God really is greater than most people's appreciation, even some people who have committed terrible, gross sins. And so I haven't really understood this. But, you know, basically, here's the answer, that all of us have been forgiven such an incalculable debt. I mean, our debt, our sin, our offense against God is so astronomical that every person, it doesn't matter if you're what people call a good sinner or if you're a bad sinner, every person has been forgiven such a huge debt that really is beyond our comprehension. And those who are considered bad sinners, it may look bad from the world standpoint, but if you really get your mind renewed, and if, say, for instance, the law, the source of condemnation, showing you how perfect God is, if you really understand how much you've been forgiven, I can see you the love of God will abound on the inside of you. And see, this is, this is what's happening now. I don't think that in the natural, I may not have been forgiven as many outward sins as somebody else. But you know what? My revelation of what I've been forgiven is greater than most because I've been under the law. And the law gives you this relative sense of unworthiness. I don't know if I'm making that clear or not. The point I'm making is that really, it's like, say, for instance, if a person is forgiven, you know, five trillion dollars worth of debt, and another one is forgiven one trillion dollars worth of debt. I don't know if you've ever sat down and tried to figure out what a trillion dollars is, but it's, it's really beyond our ability to comprehend. I've actually heard a person one time, I think it was a billion dollars with a B, a billion dollars. Uh, if you were to put that end on end, would reach from the earth to the moon and back. And I mean, it, but it was some astronomical figure like that. And a trillion dollars is even a thousand times more than that. I mean, really, it's just beyond our ability to comprehend. So the point I'm making is, a person that's only been forgiven one trillion dollars worth of debt, does that mean that they shouldn't be as excited as the person who has been forgiven five trillion? The point I'm making is, after a certain point, it, it's immaterial about what you've done, about how much you're forgiven, because after a while, it's just astronomical, and anybody with half a brain should be gracious and thankful for being forgiven a debt like that. Well, that's the way it is in our sin with the Lord. When people say that, man, they're a big sinner, and this other one's a little sinner, that's because you've never seen yourself from God's perception. God's standpoint, his, his perception is so greater than anything that you could have ever obtained on to. And I guarantee you, by most people's standard, I was Mr. Righteous. I was Mr. Holy. And yet I've seen myself through the Word. 
I've seen myself through the law. On March 23, 1968, God gave me a super revelation, supernatural revelation of my relative worth and of my hypocrisy. And I guarantee you, I saw that I was nothing in the sight of God, and that has forever changed my life. And I feel like I am forgiven as much as any murderer, rapist, uh, as any person who has been a thief, a liar, anything that you could name. I feel as forgiven as any of those people. Maybe I didn't do those things, but you know what? I, I have a perception. Uh, a relative unworthiness that came to the law. And the point that I'm trying to make through this is that I think that's right. I really do. Because you love me when you understand how much you've been doing. And you know what? The law had a purpose. The law's purpose was to make us quit trusting in ourselves, to quit thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. The law gave us a God perspective on who we really were. When you compare yourself among yourself, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and measure yourself by yourself, you aren't wise. And we do this, and we get to thinking that we're pretty smug like Simon here, looking down at this woman and saying, man, she was a sinner. Well, he was a sinner, too. He probably would have admitted that, but he says, well, I'm a sinner. I'm not a big sinner. Well, man, who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? I mean, a sinner is a sinner. There isn't hell number two or hell number three. If you sin and if you don't accept the Savior, you're going to go to hell. And man, the punishment that would be there for you is just unbelievable. And if you really understand that, Simon should have recognized that he was in the same class as his wife. In man's standard, comparing yourself among yourself, he may have looked good, but from God's standpoint, they were both headed to the exact same destination. And uh, they were going to be punished for life. And you know what? Simon had just as much reason to be thankful. It, see, it's really not a matter of degrees of sin. It's a matter of perception. We've all been forgiven an unbelievable death. And it's just some people perceive how much they've been forgiven. Some people don't. And you know, one of the ways that you understand how great your salvation is, is that... To understand how guilty you were and how deserving of wrath and punishment you were. I believe that when we stand before God, when we see people who've actually lived a better life than we have, who may have done more virtuous things than we have, and yet they never trusted in a Savior, they were trusting in their own goodness, and we see those people thrown into hell, and we see the holiness and the judgment of God, and we recognize that God. You are so much holier than I ever realized before. When we see that, our own conscience is going to be condemning us. But then we stand before God, and because we know Jesus, our Savior, He is going to say to us, Well done, our good and faithful servant. Not because we were holier than the other people, but because we trusted in the Savior. I tell you what, it's going to take billions and billions of years for us to ever get over praising God and thanking Him for us. We accepted into all the glory and the honor and the wondrous things of heaven and we deserve to go to hell. I tell you, that's going to be awesome. And there's not going to be anybody there who isn't praising God because they said, well, I just wasn't forgiven very much. We just did a little bit for them. I guarantee you, every person, every person who's ever breathed on the face of this earth has come so far short of the glory of God that if you get a revelation of your relative worth compared to God, it will make you love God much. And so the point that I'm saying to you is that, see, I see that. I see that because of my religious upbringing, being under the law and under condemnation. It gave me a sense of relative worth, and I appreciate that. And, you know, there still is that function. God is not condemning us anymore. That condemnation has been removed. 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. But there's still a condemnation coming from the devil, from all of these other sources. And I think that there still is some benefit in recognizing our relative unworthiness to God. You know, over in Isaiah chapter 50, it says, Those of you who seek after righteousness. Let me just read that to you. That's exactly what we've been teaching on in this tape series. And in Isaiah chapter 50, it says, Those of you who seek after righteousness. Let me just read that to you. That's exactly what we've been teaching on in this tape series. And in Isaiah chapter 50, Excuse me, chapter 51, Isaiah 51, verse 1. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock which ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit which ye are doing. See, this, this looks contrary. When you're talking about look to the rock from which you're hewn, that's talking about Jesus. Over in Romans chapter 9, we use that, talking about that Jesus is this rock of the sin and the stone of the sin. It talks about in the book of Daniel that Jesus was the rock hewn out from the mountain and he crushed all the kingdoms of the world. It's figuratively used, speaking of Jesus in a number of different places. So when he says, look to the rock from which you're hewn, in other words, that's talking about look to Jesus and recognize that the you know you have righteousness with God. But you are right and right standing with God. But it also says, look to the hole of the pit from which you're dead. In other words, that means look where you come from. I believe that you have to do both of these things. Again, it's just like that tightrope I was describing. You have to not only look at the fact that you are righteous in God, but then there is an apparent opposite proof, and that is who you are without God. See, that's what Paul described in the seventh chapter of the book of uh, Romans. He was describing the complete inability of our flesh, even after you're born again, the complete helplessness of us ever accomplishing God's will through our own effort, through our own power. You have to have these apparent opposite truths in balance. You have to look at the rock that you are used on, but at the same time, you have to look at the pit, the hole that you were in before God found you. And until you do that, you won't fully appreciate this righteousness that you've got. You know, in a sense, it's good for people to be under a sense of condemnation and, I mean, desperation before they come to salvation because then when they understand and accept the forgiveness that God offers, then man, they know they've been forgiven. Now, the downside to that is that it's hard to get our mind removed from all that guilt and condemnation. But, but there is a positive side, and that is that, man, we know those of us that have been have had that revelation of the law and we see our relative unworthiness, man, we appreciate and love God all the more for the great salvation that has been offered unto us. And it's amazing that there's a lot of people that don't have that perception. There's a lot of New Testament believers that, you know, all, their own standards are they always compare themselves with other people. And they didn't really understand how guilty they were before God. And so when they get born again, they, they never had a really seen themselves. They, they never have gotten to a place where they quit trusting in themselves. They still think that they are just a wonderful person. And it seems to be just like the icing on the cake to them. Man, that's not good. You need to have these apparent opposite truths, you know, uh, in, in balance that, man, without Christ, you can do nothing. Jesus said that in John chapter 15. But with him, I can do all things through him. Philippians chapter 4. You need to have those apparent opposite things. That you have no confidence in the flesh, but you have all confidence. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you an example where Jesus even used condemnation. In John chapter 8, verse 3, it says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stood down and with his finger rolled on the ground as though he heard him not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at him. And again he stood down and rolled on the ground. And they which heard it, 
being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone in the woman standing in the neck. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus answered, and, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now these people were wanting Jesus to stone this woman to death. And the scriptures doesn't reveal what's written, what he wrote on the ground. I don't know. Uh, it's just my opinion. And I'm not saying that this morning, but it's my opinion that he was either writing down scriptures or possibly he was writing down sin. And he might have even used the names of some of the mistresses of some of these Pharisees. Things that these people knew. Somehow or another, something that he was riding on the ground brought conviction to these people. And they went out and said, convicted each by their own conscience. Did you know what? Jesus was using this sense of unworthiness. They realized through something he said or wrote on the ground that they were just as guilty as this woman. That they didn't. They had sin in their own lives. You know, it could have been possible that he was writing down things that they had done that day or the day before or something. There was something that pricked their conscience. And their own conscience condemned them. Jesus used that condemnation to let them know that, hey, you aren't any more righteous than this woman is, and you hadn't got any business condemning her. And you know what? They're still is that function. Now, God is not going to condemn us. We have been made righteous with the Lord Jesus. But you know what? Your own conscience still is a standard that you shouldn't violate. A person who tries to ignore their conscience doesn't possess, you know, at their own expense. You can't do that. Again, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19 says that if you try and lay aside a good conscience, it'll make your faith shipwreck. You have to have a clear conscience before God. And you need to live in such a way that, praise God, when you do something and it violates your conscience, but you don't ignore that. If I am not teaching through this series on righteousness. But well, God loves you. You've got faith righteousness. And so now just violate your conscience. Do whatever you want to. And it's okay. I am not teaching that. I'm telling you that your conscience is a guide that isn't uh, 100% trustworthy. You have to renew it. And you have to make sure that it's based on God's word and not just religion. But even after you get a conscience that is pure, and one that is based on scriptural principles, you'll still violate it. You'll still come short. And that's not 100% bad, because you know what? It's like this internal guidance system. If you violate somebody, if you just are rude to somebody, if you know what your own conscience will convict you about it, and that can be a positive thing. It could be like the feeling in your hand. But you know, sometimes you may just accidentally lay your hand on a heater or on a stove, and you didn't look at it, you didn't think about it, but that feeling in your hand will instantly let you know that you did something you shouldn't have done, and boy, you'll recall, recoil from it. Well, that's the way that a conscience is. There's times that we get busy and we just forget, and we aren't sensitive the way that we should be. And maybe we're rude to somebody. But you know what? If you've really got a pure conscience and a heart that's sensitive, then your conscience will smite you over that. And there's a place for that. That is not wrong. Some people will say, well, I reject that. I'm righteous in the sight of God. Well, I am righteous in my spirit. And I know that. And I stand on that. When it comes to my relationship with God, I guarantee you I stand strong in the grace that's in the Lord Jesus. My spirit is sanctified and perfected forever. But you know what? I am not only a spirit. I am out here in this physical world, and I do things that are wrong. And I depend on my conscience to convict me, to condemn me, if you want to use that terminology. I depend on that. Now, I don't, I don't let it destroy me, and I don't come under guilt and shame because I just go immediately to the Lord. I purge it. And also, if I violated somebody, if I was rude to them, I go and ask forgiveness. I do whatever it takes to get that conscience straight down. I don't live under guilt and shame.
I know that by bringing these things up, somebody can understand what I'm saying and, and go back into condemnation. And that's not what I'm saying. I am not wanting us to start relating to God once again on our actions. And I'm trying to make this point. That even though God no longer condemns us, the devil condemns us. There are systems in place in this world, such as government, church, work, work home that condemn us when we do something wrong. We also have a conscience that is there to judge us every time we do something wrong. And we cannot ignore those things. Matter of fact, we have to live inside the framework of these things. So even though there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, there is condemnation when we quit walking after the Spirit and start walking in the flesh. Not condemnation from God, but condemnation from the devil. So therefore... As much as we can, we need to live holy. We need to live a life void of offense. Like Paul said, he stood before the Roman governor and he said that I have lived and exercised myself to have a conscience always void of offense. Now, I didn't mean he didn't do anything wrong, but he did everything with a good conscience and a pure heart. And you know what? That ought to be the way that we live. The conscious void of offense. We shouldn't take human righteousness and say that because I'm righteous, I can just live like the devil. No, you can't. You must. Because Satan will come in and steal, kill, and destroy. And you'll also come under the judgment of government, of your church, work, home, whatever, people who are in authority over you. And you also will come under the condemnation of your own conscience. And so, no, you can't just go live in sin. Number one, if you're truly born again, you don't want to live in sin. But number two, you don't want to give place to the devil through any of these different systems. So, praise God. Hopefully, the things that I've shared on this series about righteousness will show you that you have become righteous through faith in the Lord Jesus. That your spirit is sanctified and perfected forever. But it will also put it into balance that you'll recognize that condemnation still exists. It just doesn't come from God. God is not the one who condemns us, but Satan condemns And you can be judged. Uh, if you get out of line, then the police, the law officers, or ministers of God to punish those who do evil, I guarantee you, you go out and break the laws of this land and you'll suffer consequences. God's not the one judging you, but a system that God put in place will judge you. So there is condemnation. You don't need to live like that. And your own conscience, you cannot afford to have it condemned. It'll make your faith shipwreck. So you need to purge your conscience every time you really violate it, and then, as much as you can, you need to quit violating it, so that you can have a conscience that will bear witness and give you confidence and boldness instead of condemnation. And that's the only way you're going to effectively live a victorious Christian life. Praise God for being righteous by faith. But because I am righteous by faith, it makes me so thankful for my salvation. I recognize my relative unworthiness in the sight of God, and because of it, it has made the salvation God has given me so precious to me that I am willing to give up everything. I'm willing to deny myself to do anything it takes to walk in that integrity in my physical realm, because I want to honor God. I want to be a good testimony uh, that people can look at and see the power of God in me. I also don't want to give Satan what Number one, I just don't like sin. I do not enjoy living in strife and hatred and all of the stress that goes along with it. So I live a righteous holy life. There still is a place of condemnation in my life, I'm, but I'm not condemned by God. All of God's condemnation, all of God's judgment is absolutely gone. But you know what? My conscience is me, and I don't ignore it. I deal with it. I'm aware that if I was to go out and violate laws of this land, there would be condemnation, and then I'd accept it because I deserve it. And I'm aware that Satan's going about it. <laughs> w ciągłym stresie, który to powoduje. Prowadzą więc święte i uświęcone życie. W dalszym ciągu istnieje miejsce na potępienie, ale nie pochodzi ono od Boga. Potępienie i osąd Boży po prostu nie istnieje. Czasami moje sumienie mnie napomina i ja go nie ignoruję, ale sobie z nim radzę. Znajdę sobie sprawę, że jeśli naruszyłbym prawo, to zostałbym oskarżony. Zdaję sobie również sprawę, że żaden chłodzi 
whom he may devour, and I'm not wanting to give any place to him. So praise God, I live holy because I am righteous, not in order to become righteous. But praise God, I just pray that you have a revelation of this. I've shared a lot of material. I've shared things that it's taken me 20 or 30 years to get hold of, and I can just promise you that you haven't totally gained all of this truth just by listening to these tapes. You have to go over it and over it, and I encourage you to go back over these tapes to let God speak to you, and there's just things that you'll be getting things out of this for years to come. Let me just pray a prayer with you and ask God for supernatural revelation. Father, I'm asking you to take the things that I've said, all of these scriptures, all of these truths that we've talked about, and I'm asking through the Holy Spirit that you would burn this on people's hearts, that you would brand it in their heart, in their thinking. I ask you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that it would have impact, that you would apply it to their everyday life. And I'm just thanking you that the end result is, Father, that grace will reign through righteousness unto eternal life, like it says in Romans chapter 5. Father, we thank you, and we expect wonderful results. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.